Let me now introduce you to our speaker for today. Sister Emmanuel Mayard is a world-renowned author and international speaker in the Catholic world. She entered the Beatitudes community in 1976, and her ministry is deeply embedded in the new evangelization, feeding souls with the gospel message of hope through her speaking engagements, books, and various other media productions. Scandalous Mercy, When God Goes Beyond the Boundaries, The Hidden Child of Medjugorje, Triumph of the Heart are some of her best-selling books. She joins us today from Medjugorje, where she has been living since 1989. Please note that Sister will be available to answer some of your questions after her session. So please do use the comment section to post your questions as the session begins. I now invite Sister Emmanuel to this webinar. Listen, I'm very um, emotional today because I remember my mission in India, in Kerala, last November. It was very blessed. And I'm so happy to find you again. Very much, very much so. Today, um, I want to um, introduce you somehow with my little means uh, to the Tridium, three days, special days before Easter. And uh, yes, I'm very emotional for another reason, is that it is the first time since 2000 years plus that the churches are closed and not available for the celebration of Easter. 2000 years, the Lord has been able to give himself through the Holy Mass, through the celebration, through the prayers, the way of the cross, in the parishes, in the world, and today they are closed, not available, and empty. It's a very, very special time of distress, and uh, all the more we have now to stick to Jesus, to cling to Jesus, to be absolutely with him, and to fix our gaze on him. Not only to console him from what's happening that looks like a victory of the enemy, which is absolutely not, because we know that God always draws good from evil. He's absolutely able to do that, and he likes to do that, and he does that. So, but not only to console him, but also to be fed. To be fed in another way, we learn how to uh, seek Jesus in our lives, in our heart. Because Jesus is not limited uh, to, um, to uh, a place, to uh, opening or shutting a, 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 a church. He's not limited, he's free, he's God. He can. So we are profiting from this time, very, very difficult time, to love him more, to pray more. Uh, I want to stress on the fact that um, we learn in these days, yes, to fix our gaze on Jesus. And uh, we will go to Holy Thursday. And uh, let's just be natural, real. Let's go to the table of the Last Supper with Jesus in the company of the disciples. And uh, what, is Jesus, what is Jesus doing? What is it doing? We know that his heart is already broken into pieces because of the betrayal of Judas that he knows of. Mary also knew it. So uh, we imagine the Last Supper. Jesus knows that he has only 24 hours more to live and he would not leave from this earth without giving something, more than something, without allowing his disciples to stay with him and him, he to stay with them. And he invents this incredible, incredible thing that we would have never imagined, humanly speaking, that he will stay with us with the appearance of the bread and the wine. And he's, during this holy, Supper, he will transform the wine on the table into his blood, and first of all, the bread in his body. And uh, he, he loves us so much that he can't even think of disappearing physically without staying with us. 
And uh, he, you know, we speak about the Eucharist as a food, but imagine the food. You you take a piece of bread, for example, on an apple. Let's take an apple. This apple will come to my organism, to my body, and in very, very soon, the apple completely disappears and becomes, Sister Emmanuel, it goes everywhere in my body, in my, in my health, in myself, and very intimately. And I don't even know how it does that because uh, it's too, too subtle. When I take Jesus, no, I, well, okay, I want to say that I will, my body will transform my apple into myself, okay? Because it goes in all my cells. But when I take Jesus as my food, when I take the Eucharist, it is my food, Jesus, who transforms me into himself. Can you imagine this mystery? Can you imagine the gift that you eat Jesus? You drink the blood of Jesus. And if you let him be, if you let him, if you welcome him well, he will transform you into himself, which means you are divinized, which means everything that is his, which means everything that he has becomes mine. His beauty becomes mine. His strength becomes mine. His heart becomes mine. His little heart, you see? The blood and the host. I took a, actually, I took baby Jesus. Why? Child Jesus, sorry. Because when Jesus was on earth, even when he was 20, 33, he remained a child. He remained a child because only the ch children are welcome in the kingdom of God. He was little, he was innocent, completely innocent. So he will give me through the Eucharist all of himself. And this is why Our Lady in Medjugorje repeated and repeated that put Jesus in the Eucharist at the first place. Put Holy Mass at the first place in your life. And even she said, when you have received my son Jesus in the Eucharist, dear children, I ask you, go back to your seat, go back to your place, and then kneel down for at least 10 minutes, and then speak with my son Jesus, who is in your heart. Jesus has a human heart as well as a divine heart. And when you welcome a friend at your home, you don't say, hi, hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? And, uh, and then close the door, it's gone, it's gone, finished. No, we have to take time of intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy, intimacy. So um, we become Jesus when we, we are transformed into Jesus when we take the Eucharist. And I'll tell you one thing. When Jesus was at our Last Supper, you know, when he gave his body and blood to the disciples, he could see with a divine knowledge, he could see each host that will be consecrated in the whole history of the world until the end of the world. Which means if I take Jesus today, I take the host, the priest give me the host, Jesus saw that host, and he saw the way he'll be welcome in my heart with that host. Can you imagine? I was seen beforehand. I was seen already 2,000 year ago, years ago in the conscience, the spirit of Jesus. And maybe I was consoling him in his passion, but maybe I was not consoling him and hurting him. You know, when he saw all these hosts, he saw so many pious people, so many good souls, so many souls in love with him, you know, who will welcome with great love, great adoration, great um, thanksgiving. But he saw also the host that had been stolen by the Satanists or bad people to be, to be misused. He saw all the... Um, Christian, Catholic, whether they are Catholic, who would receive Holy Communion in a state of mortal sin or in uh, with indifference, and already he started his agony. When he gave his body and blood, he started his agony because he saw all that. But what was consoled by 
all the people who knew how to welcome him with heart. I remember a vision that one of the, of the seers here, seer from the heart, Yelena Vassil had. She was going out of the church in St. James here in Medjugorje, and she happened to see Jesus. But he was in his passion. He was, you know, his face was full of blood, dust, a mud, spit, crown of thorn, blood falling down his cheeks and uh, his garments completely torn out and something extremely, extremely difficult. And uh, he said to her a few words, you see my child, when my, my children receive me in Holy Communion, they take me, they go to the spot, they make the sign of the cross, and they leave me out. Finished. That's it. And he was in agony. He's keen that we prove, that we talk to him, that we tell him how happy we are for his visit, how grateful we are for all the gifts. Because when he came, when he comes to us, he has that incredible joy that he said even to Sister Faustina, but other mystics, he said, my greatest joy is to come into a human heart during Holy Communion. My greatest joy, can you imagine? He said also, um, for me, it's like entering another heaven. And uh, I come to unite myself with that soul and also to communicate my graces to that soul. And this kind of intimacy between the soul of Jesus and the human soul is a great mystery because it's so deep, so deep. So deep that even the angels of God who do not have Holy Communion, they kneel down before this mystery. So, um, but it's important that we are in the state of grace when we take Jesus. Because, you know, what killed Jesus? What without the instrument to kill Jesus? The nails and everything, but mortal sin are new nails. And he said, I come into certain hearts as to live another passion. So we avoid that. Okay. So with all our goodwill today, in a special way, to console Jesus from this time of distress, we want to abandon sin, renounce sin, make a good confession from the heart, from spiritual holy confession, because most of the priests cannot be seen. So, of course, we, we have this incredible opportunity to ask forgiveness from our heart and uh, also to, uh, to promise Jesus that the first opportunity we have to meet a priest, that we will make a good, sincere, deep, Holy Commune, uh, Holy Confession with the desire to change our life. Um, the power of Mass is incredible because, you know, at a certain time of the Mass, the priest is doing the offertory. And what is beautiful in this mystery of Mass is that when the priest put the, the wine in the chalice, he adds a little drop of water. What is this water for? Very simple. This water represents my offering, the offering of my own person, my own self, but also the offering of my suffering, my offering of my cross, my failures, my disappointments, my wounds, bleeding wounds, my, and also my joys, my work, everything, and also my dear ones, and also all the souls in the world. So when the priest consecrated blood into the, body, into the blood of Christ, this becomes the blood of Christ. What is about my little drop of water and my offering? My offering becomes the blood of wine, the blood of, pardon, it becomes the blood of Christ. I am divinized. I am, what I gave to Jesus was divinized. And when the priest offers a chalice with the host, the body of Christ, to the Father, the Father receiving this offering again from his Son, because you know that the altar of the Mass is like another Golgotha. So when the Father sees that offering comes to him, he's so happy, so satisfied, so touched, deeply touched, that you know what he does? 
he sent immediately rivers of peace, rivers of graces, rivers of blessing, rivers of mercy. And this is why Holy Mass is the most important thing in this world to have peace. And this is why Our Lady said, put Holy Mass at the first place in your life, dear children. You see, that's a very important. So I am sure that you will celebrate the um, Holy Thursday as, as never before, as never before. Um, I remember a great mystic in France called Marc Robin. Maybe you heard of her. If you did not, you've seen my books. <laughs> um, he, I mean, she who was a stigmatist and for 50 years she was stigmatist. She lived the Passion of Christ every week and she didn't drink, she didn't sleep, she didn't eat nothing for 50 years. And, okay. And um, she, she said something one day, she was in ecstasy, she was praying to Jesus. And the priest was there, repeated something he heard from her mouth during the ecstasy. And she was talking to Jesus, saying to him, Oh, Jesus, how I thank you, because you take us as we are, and you offer us to the Father as you are. Wow, wow, that's incredible. She, she said that. So when the Father receives our offering mixed with the blood with Jesus, he sees Jesus and he gives a lot of graces. So I invite you, my dear brothers and sisters, to take your missile, because you can't go to Mass maybe today. Take your missile and read carefully all the prayers of Mass in your missile from A to Z, with, of course, the text of the liturgy. And ask Jesus to be like at the, at the Mass in the church. Unite yourself with the Mass. Any Mass that you know is celebrated somewhere, maybe with your pastor. Those are the pastors today are shepherds without sheep. We always talk about sheep without shepherd. Now it's their turn to be shepherd without sheep. We have to pray for them because many, many, many of them will take advantage of this isolation to pray more, to be, to be closer to Jesus. But some of them, we have been, uh, we have been uh, more superficially living their priesthood, will get bored and it will can be dangerous for them. So let's also, as Arli puts it, let's pray a lot for our priest. Let the holy priest multiply. I know in Kerala, you have very holy priest. And if you have so many that you send them abroad, please think about France, okay? Just a little parenthesis. We like priests. Then Jesus, right after this beautiful Last Supper, went with his disciple to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, you know, you know the story. He was addressed by Satan, he went in agony, so much so that he was sweating blood. You can imagine the anxiety there. And he said, my soul is sad to death. Pray with me, watch with me. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. Pray so that you may not fall into temptation. So Jesus, in that moment, three hours of terrible agony, could see, and Satan was so happy to show that to him in order to discourage him. He could see all our sins, all the evil going on in the future until the end of the world. And he was crushed. He was crushed to death. To, so much so that, that, oh, Father, if you can remove that cup from me, but may you will be done not mine. He had the courage to say, okay, I will, I, will, I will drink that cup. I will drink that cup of bitterness. And this, uh, he was close to despair. Close to, okay, he didn't get into despair, but he was tempted to death. My gosh, it was terrible. And um, may your will be done is what we want to do also as a prayer because God has a plan for each of our lives 
the more we do his will that we we are inspired of during prayer of course the more you do the more we have the will to do his will we might fail sometimes of course who are we sinners but if we do that we follow the plan of god for our life and this plan is the best one and believe me this plan of god for our life is the less painful we create our pain we create our sufferings ourselves when we go astray it's more painful because then we go the wrong way we get lost and it's terrible so may your will be done lord in my life in my heart not mine i remember also a, a word that has been shocking for me at first that jesus said to sita faustina know my daughter and listen carefully it's very important for the rest of your life know my daughter that when you say that simple prayer lord may you will be done for me and not my will know my daughter that this simple prayer rises up the human soul in one moment to the summit of holiness when i read that i thought what is he talking about in one moment to summit of holiness wow i do that but how can this be possible so i checked in the <laughs> in the text in in polish to see that was not some mistranslation you know it was true it was exactly that what he said so i thought why how can this be but then in prayer the lord showed me something maybe he showed you something else but what here what he showed me is that the father when he sees a soul who tells him lord may your will be done for me and not mine what does he see or rather whom does he see jesus he sees jesus he sees the spirit of jesus he sees in us the spirit of jesus who who said that in jesus at, at the garden and he's so overwhelmed but such a prayer of his son pray who saved the world that he raises up our soul in one moment at the summit of holiness that's words of jesus read the book of little um diary of sister fosna will find it and um, but <laughs> the difference that we have with jesus is the next minute we might fall we might take back our own will we might um, sin again so we have to practice that prayer a lot a lot with jesus then jesus is arrested at the garden well we know we will follow him he is um living a very very sorrowful moments i i want to remember here that jesus was tortured um a vision actually an apparition you know in in medjugorje we have six visionaries including vitska i don't say the word now because all the names because we have little time but you'll find them so this guy is one of them and she told me one day you know sister on good friday on 1982 like one year after the beginning of the apparition mary come mary came as usual but jesus was with her on that day it was good friday and jesus was in his passion he had the crown of thorns he was all all distressed his eyes oh my god the eyes are injected with blood he was thirsty and mary said to them the visionaries look my children today i came with my son jesus in his passion so that you may see how much he has suffered for you and how much he loves you and i asked vitsia Has this, had, had Jesus also spoken to you? No, she said. Jesus has not spoken to us. But you know, sister, I looked into his eyes. And there I saw so much tenderness, so much humility, so much love that I will never, never, ever forget the eyes of Jesus. And I guess she lives all the suffering that she because she's often sick. It gives her the the joy to participate 
in the suffering of Jesus because she remembers how Jesus looked at her. And, you know, the beautiful thing, if we follow Jesus, if we ask Jesus to be really with him in these days of distress, Jesus will transform our crosses into his cross, our sufferings, our wounds into his wounds. But what came out from his wounds? Is it hatred? Is it rebellion? Is it uh, bitterness? Is it jealousy? Is it blasphemy? No. From the wounds of Jesus came, came humility, all the graces, love, peace, pardon, forgiveness, mercy, light, glory. So if we unite our wounds to that of Jesus, especially that of the heart, pierced on the cross, our own wounds will be united with Jesus. They will be then divine, and then they will bear fruit for more salvation. Now let's focus on that beautiful woman, uh, Veronica. We know from the mystic that Veronica was actually a cousin of Our Lady, a little older, and she loved Our Lady and she loved Jesus. She really loved Jesus. She was not allowed to go listen to him because her husband was opposed. He has a high position in Jerusalem, and for some reason he, can't, he couldn't stand Jesus. So she had to hide, and then on that day when she heard from the street, down from her window, you know, of her house, she heard all this confusion, this shouting and the cursing, and she saw that Jesus was there, and she, she ran out of the house, she grabbed a, a linen piece of material and she had decided to approach Jesus and to do something for him. So she was very courageous because Jesus was well guarded and well um, surrounded and she had to go through all these soldiers and with a sword and things so she could, she could have died from that. But she was courageous, her love was guiding her and uh, when she went she wasn't facing Jesus. She, you know the story. She, with the linen, she wiped off the face of Jesus, was full of blood and mud and spit and things, and uh, and give us and and Jesus give and Jesus gave her a beautiful reward. You know, he printed his own face on that linen, on that piece of material, and actually this piece of material is kept in um, in Rome in the Basilica of Saint Peter. What happened, and we might not know, is that Jesus gave another gift even better than this one to Veronica. As a reward, he actually printed his own love on her heart. She was seized by an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. She was burning for love to Jesus and to, to God, and from, from that moment to the end of her life. So she was a, a living little flame before the, the Most High and uh, she had that incredible love. So it's a, it's a gift that we can ask Jesus, but she was a reward, a reward from a beautiful gesture that she did. And I, I see through that, and it is important to mention that when the slightest little gift we give to Jesus with courage, because we too, um, we have to face uh, opposition, even persecution sometimes. And we've got to acknowledge Jesus, acknowledge our love for him, we have to stand for him. And if we do stand for him in the middle of curses and blasphemies and, uh, and agitation and mockeries and uh, whatever, we have to stand for Jesus. So this is the reward she got. Now, I want to take you to um, the, where Jesus was put on the tomb and we start Holy Saturday. Jesus is lying down in the tomb and uh, a big silence sees the whole world. The Son of God is dead. He who said, I am the life, is dead. Dead, truly dead, in the tomb. How come? This man who was so powerful in, in uh, deeds, in words, in uh, examples, 
miracles and the signs. He said, I'm the son of God. He said, I am the Messiah. He said, well, everybody knew what he was saying about him and dead. So they were like temptation, great temptation of despair. They, they could feel that he's a big failure. How come this happened? He's dead. dead. And um, the Holy Saturday is actually the day of Mary. Because Mary was the one to believe against all odds. She believed. She trusted. She remembered the words of Jesus when he announced his passion and his crucifixion. All his suffering. He was not hiding anything to his disciples. Mary knew. And, uh, the, and, and she knew that at the end he would be risen from the dead. So she knew and she believed. Now, Holy Saturday is the day of Mary. The day of the faith of Mary. The day when Mary was the column of faith of the church. And today again is exactly the same thing. You know, my, my dear friends, I must say that today we can think that the situation is very similar to that Holy Saturday. Silence, the streets are silent, the, the, the work factories are stopped. Um, you know, there is um, something incredible, very strange situation. And we are definitely in the darkness, in the, um, in the brokenness of hearts. And uh, we don't know how, lo how long it, this will last hopefully shortly but we are in this um, emptiness and we have to cling to Mary and to her faith now we know that the ch she said the church dear children is my son and the church today is in agony the church is in agony and we see through many many sides that um, we are let we are less and less powerful in the church and we are more and more attacked by all kinds of things. Today, the shepherds have no sheep. Usually we say the sheep, a sheep, sheep without shepherd, but today is shepherds without sheep. Very strange, never happened before. So the church is Jesus. That's why we love the church. Even how she is with defects and uh, sinners inside. But what I mean is that also the church is a spouse of Christ. The spouse has the same journey as Jesus. What is the journey of Jesus? 30 years of hidden life, three years of very powerful evangelization, three days of passion, death and resurrection. So, if the church is in agony, like its master, like her master Jesus, don't forget that when Jesus was in agony, it was three days before he was risen from the dead. And if we are in agony and maybe we have not touched the ground yet, the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the pool yet, you know, of the agony, well, it means that we are very, very close to the resurrection of the church. As Mary said, I am preparing a time. I'm preparing. There will be a new time and it would be it will be a time of peace. It will be a time of spring and a time that I await, that my heart awaits impatiently. So this is coming. I remember also a prophecy of Marthe Robin. She was a prophet also, and she saw all the future of the world and she said, will come a time when apparently there will be nothing left except some little community, some little groups of fervor, but hidden, persecuted, poor, without power, but filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what will form the new church, the church of the victory. And uh, Maria Pavlovich, one of the visionaries, said that the the triumph of the Immaculate Heart is very near. She said also it has already started. And we see with the birth of many, many little groups and communities, humble 
hidden but so powerful in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we follow the Lamb, we have the same journey, and um, it's very important to know that during this journey, these three days of silence and uh, distress and doubts and maybe betrayal, uh, we 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 are with a Jesus that we don't like to look at. Jesus is disfigured, as Prophet Isaiah puts it in his prophecy. So we have to love the church in these days as may never before as it is. We should just love the church because, as she said, the church is my son. And she said also that trials will come. She said, you know, if we prepare the triumph of her immaculate heart, you know, we you don't triumph over over peace you triumph over a conflict a war a difficult time we are in that difficult time and it's the time of mary this difficult time is the time of mary she's there and she said if you are with me she said sin will reign but if you are with me you will you will win you will conquer because your refuge will be the heart of my son jesus so to conclude that, Holy Saturday is a day very special where we learn from Mary to adore Jesus. Let's cling to Jesus. Let's cling to Mary. Let's be under her motherly mantle. As she said, I want to gather all of you, my children, under my motherly mantle so that you may be protected from satanic attacks. And if you are under her mantle, it means you live the gospel, you live the messages of Medjugorje, you live her words, not only Medjugorje, but Fatima, Lourdes, and Guadalupe, and where she appeared, and she will be with us. But it's not going to be easy, it's going to be beautiful. That's the promise. So I tried my best to speak a little bit about those three days of the Tridium, and that now we prepare for the resurrection. Jesus is alive, Jesus is risen from the dead, and today he's risen from the dead, and we belong to him, so we are very happy. We are very blessed, we are very privileged, and we want the whole world to know that Jesus is alive. Amen.